Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. This is uh, my first time here. This library is beautiful. This community is beautiful, too. Uh, I'm on a book tour. The book came out yesterday. So um, that means I don't get to spend any time here or see anything. And I'm out tomorrow at 5.30 in the morning. But from the walk, from the B&B to here. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. What I'd like to do is uh, uh, read a little bit from this new book and then tell you about it. And um, then just open it up for, for Q&A about this book, Cassie Duell um, series, which is formerly called the Highway Quartet, and I added another one to it, so I don't know what I call it now. I'm also Joe Pickett, um, writing anything. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, and that's always my favorite part. But as I mentioned, I'm assuming that not a lot of you have read this book since it came out yesterday. <laughs> Bitterroots, and um, this is the, the fourth Cassie Duell novel. Um, never intended to start another series, but once I started writing this particular character, um, the reception was so good, mainly from my three daughters and my wife and my female, agent and my female editor, that I felt compelled to write more. And I really enjoy writing this. It begins The crazy mountains were on fire, and Cassie Duell sat alone in her car at night on McLeod Street, across from the Grand Hotel in Big Timber, Montana, looking for a 24-year-old reprobate known as Antlerhead. That, that's when she, the call she'd been dreading came on her cell phone. It was from Rachel Mitchell, the primary defense attorney in the firm of Mitchell Estrella in Bozeman. It was from Rachel's personal <coughs> cell phone rather than her office, which, meant, which was unusual in itself. That meant the attorney was working late, and it meant a chick had come new. The call created a, cold, a stab of cold dread in Cassie's gut. She didn't need the distraction of a call from Rachel Mitchell at that moment. A call from her meant Cassie's life could be altered one way or another. She declined to answer and let it go to voicemail so she could return it later. She brushed crumbs from a half dozen chocolate-covered mini donuts from her lap and lifted her gaze from the, em from the empty sidewalk that led to the front door of the hotel to the fire on the distant mountain. It was mesmerizing and officially out of control. The long fire line extended across the entire southern face of the range like an orange zipper. And it dipped into canyons and emerged on the other side. It raced down over meadows and plateaus and spots never broke contact with the extended fire line itself. Because it was dark, there was no delineation between the fresh fuel in front of the blaze and the smoking cinders behind it. The fire seemed to be a living thing, a snake, a nocturnal beast more alive at night than during the day. It burned bright enough that it stained the bellies of low-hanging clouds with pink hues. When Cassie closed her eyes, the fire lingered as it imprinted inside her eyelids. She could imagine the line of fire eating its way down through the timber and eventually consuming the grassland of the prairie all the way to I-90 and big timber itself, unless the wind turned it west or south. Like most of the summer, the September air was thick with smoke. It haloed a few downtown streetlights, and she could smell it on her clothing. She had a sore throat from breathing it, breathing it in all day. On some mornings, she brushed a thin film of white ash from the hood and windshield of her cheap Cherokee as if it were snow in the winter. It had been the summer of fire in Montana, and it wasn't over yet. And I'm jumping ahead. Antlerhead's given name was Jerry Allen. He received his nickname several years before while on work release from the Montana State Prison in Deer Lodge after his conviction for a series of house and cabin work. Allen was assigned part-time to a wild game processing facility outside of Anaconda during hunting season. That's where he kept the newly delivered severed head and set of six by six antlers onto his shoulders and said to his co-workers and fellow inmates, look at me, I'm an elk. Seconds before he slipped on a smear of blood and his, and his strength and balance gave out, 120 pounds of antlers crashed down on top of him and laid him out on the loading dock. One of the sharp tines entered his skull just above his right eyebrow, and another had his clavicle and punctured lung. His next job, once he was released from the hospital after two months' stay and ten months of physical rehab, courtesy of Montana taxpayers, was a prison laundry. 
<laughs> the recent arrest photos of him showed a rail-thin, gaunt-faced man with a mop of brown hair, a long, crooked nose, and a dull, feral eyes. Above his left eyebrow was a sunken red dent of the scar, which was no doubt the spot where the amber time had penetrated his skull. Cassie was reminded that in just about every instance, losers looked like losers. Alan was a poster child for losers. Antler Head Alan was going back to prison in Deer Lodge for a very long time, which was fine with Cassie. That's where he belonged. Except that following his arraignment hearing two days before, after his parents scraped together a $150,000 bond that allowed him to walk out of the county jail and tell his criminal trial, Antler Head had vanished and his parents were on the hook for the money. Cassie finds Amberhead and returns him, and um, then she makes the call she's been ready. And what she finds out is that, um, those of you who've read previous books with Cassie, you will know that um, in, her pre in her previous one, she was the chief investigator of the Sheriff's Department in Montana, and then the Bakken County in North Dakota. So she's always been in law enforcement. In this book, she has opened up her own private investigative firm back in her home in Bozeman, Montana. Primarily um, because she's got a she's a single mom. Um, her husband was killed in Afghanistan, and she's got a 15-year-old son. And she thinks by just being able to set her own hours, she might be able to spend more time with him. Um, didn't work out that way very often, but um, she owes a chit to uh, this defense attorney, uh, who's if you've read previous books, you know why. So she dreads it because she's never been on the other side. And she especially dreads it when she finds out that the defense attorney's client is the oldest son of a very dysfunctional ranch family in northern Montana in the Bitterroot Valley. And this oldest son has been accused of assaulting and raping his 15-year-old niece. Um, horrible crime. And Cassie wants no part of uh, maybe helping the defense um, with him. But the attorney convinces her that if nothing else, she, if she can confirm that the investigation was done well and everything was above board, then she can maybe talk this client into taking a plea bargain and going to, going to jail and trial. So Cassie heads north to a place called Loxa County, which is fictional, but is based um, in, the, in the Bitterroot Mountains, the Bitterroot Range, around the Bitterroot River, um, around Missoula and Hamilton in Montana, a place she's somewhat familiar with. And she finds out that she gets a lot of pushback immediately from local law enforcement, which she doesn't expect, because she's never been on the other side before. And on her entire career, she's come to kind of despise private investigators, and especially defense attorneys. And then, um, then she gets not just pushback, but almost violent reaction from the family itself. Um, she finds out that the son who's in jail is the oldest boy. He, his crime to them was that he left the ranch the first chance he could, made a life of his own as a hedge fund manager in New York, and had come back to manage the family finances, but his brothers and sisters all hate each other. So Cassidy gets embroiled in the middle of this thing. Um, one, of the re one of the inspirations for this book is that I used to, way back used to be a journalist in Wyoming, and I covered several big cases where in the third, oops, cell phone. <laughs> in the third or fourth generation of the ranch, um, the grandchildren or great grandchildren go to war with each other because they don't all want to stay on the ranch. Some want to keep it, some want to take it over, some want to sell it. And there's some really violent con concentration confrontations on the ranches. And I wanted to take it up to a, a huge level in this book and talk about multi generational ranch families who had huge influence in their areas and are still running it, and Kathy's up against all of them. It's a very dark book, like all of the, uh, the Highway series has been, a dark spiral. Um, uh, so, like I said, so far the reception has been good. It got all-star reviews from all the, all the services that do that, Publishers Weekly, um, Perkis, Library Journal. Um, so far, so good. Uh, and hopefully you'll enjoy it, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about this book or the Joe Pickett series or any other questions that you might have. I have a feeling you're not going to be that shy. Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, that's for my wife. Um, <laughs> oh, it's her. Is it an embarrassing question? You're going to bring back me, Roman Oh. <laughs>
I've never really gone away. Um, I've just finished last week before the, this book um, came out. I finished the first draft of the next Joe Pickett novel, which is great. Right. That doesn't mean it's done. I have to go back and redo it. But, but that's it's called Long Range. It will be out next March. Um, Nate Romanowski is in it. But if you read the, the, the I, I don't want to give away spoilers if people haven't read them all. But he had a life-changing event at the end of the last book. Yes, yeah. uh, this book yes, finds him in a whole new place in his life. And he doesn't know if he can quite handle it. So he'll be back. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Back on Nate. Back on Nate. <laughs> Where did you get inspiration? Where? Character. Uh, unlike almost all, you know, there's, there's sometimes an assumption, I think, that most fictional characters must be based on somebody. Um, and in some cases, that's, in most cases in my, in my life, it's not true. Um, Joe Pickett is not based on a particular Dane Norton. Um, his wife's kind of based a little bit on my wife, because she's a horsewoman. But, um, <laughs> the, the one character in the series that really is really, is Nate Romanowski, is based on a friend of mine that um, I grew up with in Wyoming, who's a year ahead of me in high school. He was a big blonde guy, um, middle linebacker on the football team. He was a falconer and um, went on to the Air Force Academy and then into special forces. And I used to go falconry hunting with him, um, both before and after uh, he got back. So all the falconry stuff I learned from him. He's not, it, falconers are a strange breed and I met a lot of them through him and I've never falconer myself. I could not devote my life to Falcons like they have to. But he was he was an interesting guy. He's still around. And I send him every book. Um, he, you know, he, the kind of weird relationship they have with, you know, the circle of life is pretty brutal at times. You know, I mean, to feed Falcons, you have to do all sorts of things. He's the only guy I've ever seen punch a rabbit in the head. <laughs> and then read it to his Falcons. <laughs> but he doesn't rip people's ears off. <laughs> yes. Joe's mother. Is that based on my mother-in-law? No, but the kinds of words. That's not true. That's just a cheap. That's a cheap joke. Um, uh, th that character, it, 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 interestingly enough, my wife is rereading the entire Joe Pickett series. Because um, she all, all read it in manuscript form, but then in fact, the only they were published and changes were made, so she thought she just read it. And she kind of reminded me of something I kind of forgot to mention. The third book, Winter Kill, is when both Nate and Missy, Joe's mother in law, both really become characters. And I didn't plan it that way. It wasn't, um, I just, it, that book is a tough book for Joe Pickett. And you know, if you write these kind of books, I remember actually thinking, what what can I do to make his life even more miserable? <laughs> and that's how his mother-in-law show. <laughs> and she just, as you know, just keeps hanging around. And she show up again. Yes, sir, in the back. How long did you have time until, what's your name, Sheridan, the oldest daughter, mm -hmm. and dad's footsteps to become a game warden? Um, I won't reveal what, her next step is because it's a little bit book. <laughs> but um, it, it's a little different than you might imagine. Yes? How would you uh, compare you know, Joe Pickett to Walt Longmire? Uh -huh. Joe Pickett was there first. <laughs> 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 um, well, I mean, obviously, Joe Pickett worked for the state of Wyoming. So it's not like it. And it's more, I think, uh, definitely the, you know, the books are more um, environmentally, um, the, 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 the issues are not necessarily always law enforcement per se, although they might turn into it, but they might start out about, you know, wildlife management or, re or energy um, issues, you know, environmentalism. They're more resource-based, outdoor-oriented. Yes, sir. First of all, thank you for uh, Joe Pickett. For sure. He is uh, awesome. Thank you. My question is, being the uh, author of the series, if 
how did it came to you and said, who would you like to be, who would you like to have Joe Pickett be? What would be the first name of well, I, I, you know, I, I don't have one. Um, I've been asked that question a lot over the years. I've never envisioned Joe Pickett as an actor. Um, there's other people I write about sometimes. I think, oh, this this actor would be perfect for that. But I've always, seriously, always, I envision a game, a couple of game words I've met, um, and I'm unassuming types. And strangely enough, it was pointed out to me it was never planned this way. Um, he's never described. We're 20 books in, and the only description of Joe Pickett is that he was of medium height and build. That's it. So he looks like whatever you think he looks like. And he looks like whatever I think he looks like, I guess. But I didn't do that intentionally. Um, there, there is a... Uh, right now, the whole Joe Pickett series was, has been uh, optioned for a television series. And it's at, um, it's at Paramount TV, and they, uh, they've hired showrunners and we've written a pilot script who are in this summer in the process of, of taking it out to networks and streaming services. I haven't heard definitely where it might land and they haven't started casting yet. For a while they had an actor um, who wanted to be Joe Pickett that I was kind of excited about and found out. But the guy dropped out. He had another commitment. So that may, we, you know, we may find out what he looks like. <laughs> Dual books are all have all been optioned by uh, producer David E. Kelly, who did Big Little Lies, all of them. He's interested in developing a series for Kathy Dual. All it's nothing's we haven't you know obviously nothing's on yet. Haven't seen anything yet, but you know the checks cashed. <laughs> Part of it, 
part of it is 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 contractual because I have um, you know, deadlines with each one. But the other thing, it, all of the Joe Pickett books take place in Wyoming. All of the standalones or Cassie books or Highway books all take place outside of Wyoming and other states. So it kind of once I've got the idea in mind, I, I kind of figured out the best setting for it. Um, the book The Highway, which is the creepiest book I ever wrote, or Blue Heaven. Um, Blue Heaven had to be set in Idaho because that's where the, the real Blue Heaven was, where all these um, XLA cops wound up in the Panhandle of Idaho. So I had to be specific to that place. So it's, it's both the place and the rotation. I know. And I like, I, you know, I think I like writing the standalones in addition to the Joe Pickett series because I think it helps keep it fresh. And I can do things in those books that I would not do in the Joe Pickett books that I think helps me as a writer. Um, although this side, I'm doing this. Yes? Uh, the inspiration for Nowhere to Run? Oh, no. Uh, that, uh, that one is a Joe Pickett book. That's when he goes up into the, the mountains and confronts two identical twin brothers. Um, creepy, creepy book, and those guys are creepy. That's the only book in the Joe Pickett series that's based on a real Wyoming game warden incident, where two Wyoming game wardens went up into the Wind River Mountains, not the big ones, but the Wind Rivers, and they actually did confront two six foot five identical twin brothers who were living up there in a pup tent. And, um, who scared these two game wardens so badly. Uh, they just got this weird vibe. The, the first few pages of that book with the guy fishing and he scales up the mountain that they can hardly keep up on and they finally find a camp and then they realize how this guy get here so fast. Well, it wasn't him, it was his brother who looks exactly like him. That whole thing actually happened. And um, it was after, several years after I wrote that book, one of the two game wardens who were up there said, did I ever tell you I took a picture of those guys? <laughs> no. <laughs> he showed me this picture that I still have, but he actually, he hung his camera down underneath the, the neck of his horse as they approached him and took pictures of the guy out in the lake. He, he said, that way when they found my body, they go and kill me. <laughs> but these brothers, um, the, at, the game wardens came back now because they, they saw the stuff in their camp that had to be stolen from cars and cattle. But they couldn't arrest them, uh, you know, it's so remote. What are they going to arrest them for, you know, having a nice thing? Um, so, so they put the word out up and down the front range about these two. They were never spotted again. Well, this side, yes? If I have a friend that maybe has never read one of your books, which one would you recommend they start with? Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I usually, I, I when I, I usually would recommend either Open Season, which is the first Joe Pickett novel which introduces him, or Blue Heaven, which is a total standalone. Um, won the Edgar Award in uh, 2009. Um, and, and if you like that one, you'd like that one. Yes? Um, I have a friend who has a book that she has never read. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend that she start with that one? Or do you recommend that I, I talked to a, 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 a detective once who, who read the Joe Pickett books, a detective, detective on Montana, in Montana, and he said, yeah, I've got a guy like that. We just call him a shit man. <laughs> no matter where he goes. <laughs> so a little bit of that, and the fact that, you know, Joe Pickett is not the sharpest knife in the world, so, but he's very relentless. And when people, you know, his superiors say, back off, we don't need he doesn't do that. He, he just has to find out. And by doing that, he gets himself deeper in a lot of cases, as you know. Keep it up. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> yes? Um, speaking of Joe Pickett, um, his I know he's not the best shot in the book. The what? Best shot. Oh, no, it's not. Where did he get that No. I'm a much better shot. <laughs> um, I, I, just, I like the idea of, um, first of all, when I wrote the very first book, I was not planning, I wasn't planning on a series. It wasn't like I was setting this stuff up. I just like when I was doing that character, it was more about the Endangered Species Act and the modern West. I looked at it as contemporary Western novel, not necessarily a mystery. And I like the idea of a family man, um, not a you know, lone wolf detective type. 
And I, I like the idea that he, um, you know, game wardens don't have to pull their guns very often, really, even though they're very heavily armed. I like the idea that he wasn't a good, very good shot, that um, you never knew, because it adds tension, because you never know what's going to happen. Um, but, uh, a few years ago, I was doing research for a novel um, called The uh, Back of Beyond, and I went to Montana and went on a ride along with um, some uh, deputies in Helena, Montana. That's where I was going to sit. I landed, and the first thing they did was they took me to the range, their, their shooting range, and started getting their guns out. And I said, you guys, I, can, I know how to shoot. You know, it's, you're thinking of Joe Pickett. <laughs> They thought they were really going to do a favor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, back to Nate Romanowski a minute. Um, you've alluded a lot. Boy, this is Nate Romanowski. <laughs> <that's right. laughs> He's a great character. Uh, uh, you've alluded a lot to his, uh, a little bit to his backstory. But is there any plans to do a, like a complete backstory on Nate? I don't have plans to do it. A lot of that was filled in in the book Force of Nature. <laughs> Um, it's more of a Nate book than a Joe book. It goes back to him growing up and starting in falconry and what he did in the military, what he did in special ops. And then, you know, it basically explains why he is the way he is. And, and I, I don't know how much more I would add to that. Maybe I missed that That's really, that's, that's another high body count book. Okay. It's called Force of Nature. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I do always, I'm an outliner. Um, I, a lot of my author friends aren't. And there's no right way to do it or wrong way to do it. But for me, what works best is I always, I, I usually I, I start with two ideas or issues or controversies that I want to include in every book. Um, in like, for example, in the Bitterroots, the, uh, uh, the forest fire, in, 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 and then also the multi-generational ranch family. Then I do the research on those things, so I've got my facts straight. And a lot of times that involves going to different places, going to places where the books are set, or interviewing people who are um, experts in that field on both sides, and trying not to do an agenda book. And then once I've got that down, then I start a bullet point outline from chapter one to the end. And um, then I make a list of new characters, make a list of reoccurring characters, where were they in the last book, how old were they in the first book, that kind of thing. And then I start writing literally on top of the outline. And so I work every day, um, I mean five days a week, I don't work on the weekends usually, um, thousand words a day minimum, and then the next day I edit what I did the day before and then push forward. And that's that's been my method since the very first book. And it works for me. Some people will say, some authors will say, they don't want to know the ending. Because then they think the reader will figure it all out. I give the reader. I don't agree. I think because I think I've read too many books that you know, like three quarters of the way through, you start to get that weird feeling when the captain doesn't know where the ship is headed. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes they get into port, and then, but not sometimes they don't. You know, and I, I think that's not fair. Yes. Yes. I did, yes to both questions. Uh, but my, my focus as a kid was in even high school and um, college was journalism as opposed to reading and writing. Um, and it wasn't until I was out of, I would work for newspapers then and columns and uh, did feature stories. And it, so that's, that's where it came from. But I think, I do remember going to the local library in Casper, Wyoming where I grew up as a, maybe 10 or 11 year old boy. And I do remember going down the aisles into the bees to figure out where my book would be. So, <laughs> so I, think, I think you're either hardwired to write or not. And, and I wasn't even thinking fiction, not fiction. I was into the bees. And I've since learned better to see the space where the book was checked out than the <laughs> inventory that's in the library. <laughs> Not a specific librarian, but um, several I've, I've known or met over the years. 
I used to hang out in the library a lot when I was a kid. I was a red-blooded Wyoming boy. I would hunt and fish and I was in sports, but my dirty little secret was I would ride my bike to the library and read books. And librarians there would suggest books and more challenging books. And I learned, learned more in the library than I ever learned in school. So I feel <laughs> soft spot in my heart for libraries. And now there's like this one, um, so impressive. You know, the libraries in a lot of places like this have become more community centers than libraries, and I think that's a great transition. Yes, sir. How did you come to cast uh, a traveling? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. How did you come to cast a labrador retriever uh, traveling? Oh, with a uh, oh, be because that's very uh, typical of Wyoming game rooms in real life. Um, rarely, I mean, they do have those green trucks. They wear red uniform shirts, and almost all of them <coughs> ride with their dogs all day. And most of them are labs. And I'm a lab guy. So whatever the name of the lab is in the book is, is my lab at the time. So Daisy's my lab. And we don't have a half lab, half corgi named two. Yes. Thank you. Uh, that's one of my favorite part. I, uh, I was at an event last night and somebody asked who, who we hired to do our research. <laughs> um, there are some authors who do that, but I love the research part myself because it gets me into the book more than anything else. Going to the place and then doing talking to people. But I found is, is a lot of reporters would say the same thing. Um, even if you go up to somebody who's very nervous or doesn't want to talk or doesn't want to reveal too much. There's something about an open notebook and you start scribbling that keeps them talking. Um, I've had people tell me things they should never have told me. And I, I, I remember there was a book called um, um, Off the Grid about basically how do you take down um, you know, a supercomputer. I learned that at a supercomputer outlet because the guys would not stop telling me. Um, and I kept stuff out because they really did give me point by point how to take it down. Because that's what they think about all day and they rarely ask those questions by somebody who's really interested. And I, I've never had anyone ever refuse on either side of the controversy to say I won't talk to you. And if I never send anybody the whole book for their approval but if it's a technical thing, I'll send them those couple of paragraphs and say, did I get this right? And they're very happy. Everybody wants their profession or their point of view um, portrayed accurately. And, and so they're, they're, I found people to be very helpful. And cops, you know, they spend all day figuring out how would they kill somebody, how would they <laughs> kill somebody. Some of the wildest, you know, murders I've ever had in the books were suggested by cops who thought, you know, I wonder if you could, I had to actually do the research on this one, you know, could you actually get a person up to the top of a wind turbine um, and, and chain them to the blade? And, yes, you can. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Your name is. During your free time, who do you like to read? Um, I read pretty widely. I try not to just read in mystery or crime. I read fiction, nonfiction, fiction, nonfiction. Um, my favorite, probably my favorite authors, uh, Tom McGuane, Thomas McGuane, uh, Wallace Stegner, uh, Jim Harrison, um, in uh, Cormac McCarthy, in, in, the, in the mystery kind of crime genre. I'm a big fan of Michael Connelly and John Sanford. Denise Mina is a real favorite. And, and I do. A, I read a lot of first novels because people want blurbs and quotes for them. But my go-to ones are, are the ones I've mentioned. Yes. It took forever. Uh, they, I it took 20 years. And once I kind of came up with the idea, it wasn't ready to go for 20 years. Um, but it, I wrote two not two manuscripts that really, in retrospect, weren't very good. But um, finally got this one that became open season that I called Joe Pickett. And I was told, okay, this is kind of a long story, but it's a good payoff. Um, 
I was told you needed a New York agent, you know, if you're going to, if you really want a commercial book published. And I, that is true. That's the truth. And this was back in, um, you know, 1996. And uh, we found a name, somebody who expressed interest. Um, contacted the Wyoming Arts Council. I had to physically, this is pre-internet, pre-email, all that. I right? print it out and physically send it to him in the mail in New York. And he said he'd represent me. And um, then we waited and waited. And a year went by and I'd call him and he'd say, ah, I, you know, I can't place it anywhere. It's too unusual. It doesn't really fit. It's kind of environmental. kind of takes place, you know, place nobody's ever heard of. Um, and basically said, quit calling me. You know, I'll let you know if something happens. So I had to wait another year, another year goes by, and um, I finally went to this uh, writer's conference in Denver, uh, in, in, where you pitch your novel, like people pitch movies, and I was talking to an agent, and I told him what this book was about, and he was interested, mainly because it was done, and um, he said, you have an agent? And I said, yeah, I do, you know, and I told him the guy's name, and he, he's, he looked at me and he said, you don't know he's dead, do you? <laughs> he's been dead for like nine months. <laughs> but the story got around this conference about the guy and his dead agent. <laughs> this, uh, a new, uh, an editor who was 24 years old who worked at Putnam heard it and was intrigued with the story and actually contacted me and then uh, three book deal was offered. So a very weird route to get there. <laughs> yes, sir. From initial idea to sending off the final revised version, how long does it take to do an average Joe Pickett movie? Or novel? Um, after, probably like seven to nine months, and then there, then there's also and then there's revisions and copy edits and so on. You know, I've long learned not to get too satisfied once I write the end, because I know I'm just going to be right back at it very, very quickly after that. But it still feels good. It's, the, the standalones or the casting ones tend to take longer because um, there's more new characters, uh, except for her, and um, also because I'm writing like, basically a book and a half a year. That's how the power works out. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Um, when I kind of split them though. Uh, I usually, like the Cassie book or the standalone, I'll write half of it and then I'll sit it aside completely and finish and write the entire Joe Pickett book and then go back to it. But I can't. I, I can't even imagine trying to do that with two going at the same time. I've heard it, some people do it, but I'm afraid too much of we one spies ideas will bleed from one into the other. Yes, sir. What is your most creative time? What is CJ Fox sitting down? Is it early in the morning, late at night? It can be both, um, but I generally write in the morning. You know, I've got on I've got on Jags where um, I'll do like three or four sessions in a, in a day. It's usually toward the end of the book when I'm getting when things are getting wild, I'm getting all excited. But generally, on a normal day, it's it's uh, in the morning. Um, you know, I, I write at least a thousand words, like I said, and um, then I figure it's not done for the day. I think that a thousand words can take two hours or it can take seven hours. So I, it's more of the word count than the hours. Yes? Most of the... I've got kind of a rule. If, if, I'm, if I've got a fictional town or city, it's all, you know, Saddle Spring does not exist as a town. This is a location. So anything I say in that, I've made up the streets. But if I say, like, in The Disappeared, that it's he's driving to Saratoga, Wyoming, every road is accurate, and every place he goes through is true. When he goes to Jackson Hole, Yellowstone. Uh, but when, it, when it's a fictional kind of little town, it's, I just made it. It's always usually based on real places, but I don't use the actual place name. Yes? Or Falcon? 
Falcons really sold to the Middle East? Oh yeah. Now that's a. It's not quite as. Um, it, it's not as illicit a market as it was at one time. Now they can be bought legally. But um, for a while, when, when uh, peregrine falcons, for example, were almost on the endangered species list, uh, now there's a lot of them. But at the time, that was getting it, it, people who trafficked in peregrine falcons were, you know, kind of taking their life in their own hands. But no, I've seen that done. Um, the, I've, I, and I remember seeing falconers who would actually climb up and get the little ones and raise them and then figure out ways to sell them. Uh, the Middle East, where it, it, there's a scene in uh, Force of Nature, that book, the, the Nate Romanowski book, where um, Nate regrets this one instance where the U.S. government had targeted Osama bin Laden at a, a falconry camp and didn't pull the trigger. Um, that actually happened. Yeah, it was in the book The Looming Tower when the, when the Pulitzer Prize. When I read that scene about the falconry camp, and the fact that they thought he was there, they knew he was there, but they didn't go after him, and that would have prevented everything, really stuck in my mind. And the year of that worked for Nate Romanowski, and I thought if he was there, this explains everything. So. Yes? You've lived in Wyoming most of your life, I have. Yeah, you seen Wyoming change uh, over the years, or other parts of the country? I think we've added like 10 residents. <laughs> Churn, but we haven't really. It's, it's still. It's, it's. I think it, it's about six hundred thousand people. Um, but it's still basically the same size. Some some towns have grown, some have shrunk, but it hasn't boomed. Um, it's, inter it's a fascinating state because it's, it's so huge, um, and there's so there's a lot of interesting personalities in it, for sure. But I think it's also kind of extreme weather, which scares people off. But it's, it's, it's slowly grown. Let's see, I better go on this side. Yes, ma'am. Do you have livestock Yes. Cows and horses. Yeah. Beef cows. Beef cows, yeah. It, I don't own them. We lease it out to a local rancher, which is um, really, I think, the way to go because then I don't have to mess around with them. <laughs> so we, we have an irrigated beef field, and, and that's where the, the cows are for like six months of the year. And my wife's, they're my wife's horses, so. Yep. Yes, they are. Yes? What's the difference between a one-track road and a two-track road? <laughs> well, a two-track road is just simply two tracks that don't have grass on it, you know, that's, that's not paved in any way. I don't know what a one-track road is. I guess that's a motorcycle. <laughs> Yes, in fact. Yeah, I'm, I'm going backpacking in the Wind Rivers this fall, so oh, I cool. thank you for the story about the twins. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it was nice to know you. Yeah. <laughs> may have lost the buyer for the book in March. <laughs> uh, what, what kind of feedback did you get from Wyoming Fishing Game about the characters you portrayed that are employed in that service? Um, the game wardens themselves all tend to really like the, the books and um, are kind of proud of the fact that a game warden is, you know, had this kind of prominent in these prominent books. And I try to be very accurate when it comes to their daily lives and what they do and what their jobs are. And even though obviously you've got to suspend disbelief to think that Joe, you know, any game warden could go through all the things Joe Biggin had, but almost all of them are based in real things before they spin out of control. And they're, the game wardens are very supportive, and I know a lot of them. Um, and I go on ride alongs with them all the time. Some of the headquarters people in Cheyenne, the bureaucrats, are not quite as proud. <laughs> I don't care. Maybe should we do one more, maybe? Yes, ma'am. Why did you decide to give Joe three daughters? That is big. I mean, I have three daughters. And so I did know what it was like to be in a household of, you know, all females. It was Joe refers to, which I used to call every night returning to the house of feelings. <laughs> <laughs> but I also thought, um, in the first, I like the juxtaposition between, you 
you know, a game warden is kind of really rough outdoor sort of thing, lots of men, almost all hunting camps are men, um, and then having daughters as well at the same, you know, kind of the, to even things out and to return to. And I, you know, they're smart and strong. They're not just, you know, little, little girls. So. Well, I think that should be. Uh, Would you all think it's wonderful? Uh,